Welcome to the Supernatural with Laura Maxwell on Eternal Radio. In these programs, we will hear the true supernatural accounts from those who tried various spiritualities. You shall tell the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is part four of our interview about seeking EVP recordings of ghosts, angels and so on with our guest Mark Hunneman, who is an author of Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes and he is also a deliverance minister or commonly um, known as an exorcist. And Mark also helps me um, on one of my Facebook pages um, as a, an assistant there. So that shows you the level of uh, respect and trust that I have in Mark. And really, p- part four, so let's go over now and say hello to Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey, Laura, hey. It's so good to hear you. your voice again. I'm, I'm doing good. Good. How about yourself? Good. Yes, it's good to hear you too. And um, these shows are are always very informative when we have you on. So thanks again for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. It really is. This is a highlight of, um, it has been for for a long time. So thank you very much. Oh, that's wonderful. And definitely your your, um, shows are a highlight for me um, through my time in ministry as well, just because you have such a heart for this subject and because you have researched it so very thoroughly um so absolutely god god is good and um amen basically um you know so far we've been touching on this and we've done some shows before in the past and now it's it's really time um for us to go a bit deeper into topics because Sometimes you just can't go into it deep enough and, and it's almost like we're on the surface and people require, uh, d- you know, deeper e- explanations for things. So we're going yes. to go into more detail about this um, idea of testing the entities in Jesus' name and what that fully involves. Um, and You know, because some people have said, and we've heard this too, that sometimes an entity will say, yes, I believe Jesus is Lord. Um, and, and there is a deeper testing that is needed until these entities do show their true colours and, and the, the lies and the deceit begin to be revealed. Some people that get the instant test um, result and some people it needs this deeper um, challenge, mm-hmm. which we certainly will go into th- from our own years of experience and from hearing from others. Um, so that'll be fascinating because we will give some real life examples and First, though, it's time to really look a bit more deeply at the Bible, what it has to say about this, and specifically with regards to the Old Testament and how there are Old Testament um, teachings that are still very relevant today in this um, whole area. You know, we feel that necromancy is, is still dangerous today still um warned about in scripture um from the old testament and basically you know a demon is still a demon in our point of view whether it was old testament times or these days so mark um is going to go into more detail about morality and we also know some people will say well you know jesus came um, 2,000 years ago and there were certain things from the Old Testament that he done away with that are not relevant in New Testament times or in today's culture and Mark is going to open that whole discussion up to really look at the different types of Old Testament laws and specifically how it is relevant to this subject we are exploring. So Mark please do get into that whole uh, discussion with us. Yes, uh, I think thank you, Laura. Um, I think good communication tries to anticipate objections or legitimate questions that people have, mm-hmm. and one of those is what you said, and that is how does the Old Testament apply to today? 
And um, every Christian wrestles with the question, how does Old Testament law relate to our lives today? Um, is the Old Testament law irrelevant to Christians, or is there some sense in which we're still bound by portions of it? Um, there is a heresy called antinomianism, uh, which is pervasive in our culture, and that just means against the law mm -hmm. um, that we, but that's not really what we're really dealing with. It's, it's folks have, there's so much in the Old Testament that, like you said, the Old Testament always are to obey. Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean that Jesus fulfilled it or clarified it? And uh, we will we'll try to answer some of those questions because the teaching in Deuteronomy 18, for example, is so clear. Um, so the need to answer these questions really is urgent. Mm -hmm. And for me, my back, my heritage is the Reformation, I mean, which is the Bible. Uh, but the Reformation was founded on grace and not upon law, and yet it's the law of God was not repudiated by the reformers. John Calvin, for example, wrote what has become known as a threefold use of law, and he shows the importance of law for the Christian life. And before I read those three things, I just wanted to say this. Um, by studying or meditating on the law of God, we attend the school of righteousness. We learn when we study God's Old Testament law, we learn what pleases God and what offends him. The moral law of God that God reveals in the scriptures, including the Old Testament, is always binding upon us. We're going to talk about three kinds of Old Testament laws. There's mm -hmm. a moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. But the moral law is something that's still binding upon us. Every old, every inch of the Old Testament is still binding in some sense. Every inch of the Old Testament is still relevant and applicable to today. However, we have to be discerning in how we apply it. For example, you know, come back to this, the, the sacrificial system, we know that Jesus fulfilled that and that we would not and must not sacrifice the animals again because Christ was the once for all Lamb of God who was slain for us. But we'll come back to that. But let me just say this. The moral law that God reveals in Scripture is always binding upon us. Our redemption, and this is the key point, y'all, our redemption is from the curse of God's law, not from our duty to obey it. We are justified not because of our obedience to the law, but in order that we, we may become obedient um, to God's law. To love Christ is to keep his commandments. To love God is to obey his law. You see that in, like, for example, uh, Psalm uh, 119. And so there's... Um, May I first talk about the, the different purposes of law and then jump into... Yes, um, please do. Okay. For example, again, I'm going back to Calvin, but this is something I think that is, for me, expresses from Genesis to Revelation a real concise view of, of the purpose of the law, mm -hmm. whether it's all the New Testament. And we have to remember, help me to remember, Laura, that two key passages um, are... 2 Timothy 3, and then Jesus' words in Matthew 5 uh, about the continuity of the authority of, um, uh, of the Old Testament. Because mm -hmm. in 2 Timothy, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And the first um, referent, to that is the Old Testament. The New Testament was still in progress of being put together. So when Paul wrote that, um, he was, he had in mind specifically Old Testament as being God and still um, mm -hmm. profitable for us to, to basically to teach us how to live in a way that's pleasing to God. Because when we say you know, the first commandment of God, Laura, and the law of God reveals to us specific ways that God is pleased 
and specific ways or things that we can think or do or say that displease him, mm -hmm. which we'll get to. But the first, per there's three three purpose, uh, purposes of the law. First one is is that it is a mirror, um, and it's a mirror in two ways, Laura. On the one hand, it it reflects the character of God, which would include his holiness and his love, okay? Mm -hmm. And this, the flip side of that, as far as the law being a mirror, is that since it reflects God's law, it then also reflects our sinfulness. Because without the law, can't see how far short we fall of God's character and of his demands of us. So it, it, it's important, law and gospel, before we see, we need the law in order to point us to Christ. So, which brings us to the second purpose of the law, and that's the restraint of evil. And that can be seen in human governments. We just need the law uh, in order to help restrain evil from taking ulster. Mm -hmm. The third purpose of the law is to reveal, and this is the main function, the third purpose of the law is to reveal what is pleasing to God. As born-again children of God, the law enlightens us as to what is pleasing to our Father, whom we and the Christian should delight in the law as God himself delights in it. Jesus said, if my commandments, John 14, 15. This is the highest function of the law, to serve as an instrument for the people of God to give him honor and glory. And again, to learn what is pleasing and displeasing to him. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, the purpose, the different purposes of the law. Now, did you want to stop here a second before we jumped into the three kinds of, of law? Um, yeah, I think it's fascinating. And, and I think that, you know, there will be people who don't realize there's three kinds of law. And that's why they feel, you know, in a sense, maybe we can pick and choose nowadays because they'll say, for example, well, the Old Testament says don't eat certain kind of shellfish or don't eat pigs or whatever. Uh, now we can. So... Yeah, I think it, it is important to um, explain the, the different kinds of, of law uh, and really what that means and how that's relevant. So, yeah, please, please do continue. Okay, well, let's do that then. Uh, in the Old Testament, there were three kinds of law. Um, and if we want to understand the law in the New Testament, again, with this with this basic classification. Um, there is the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. Mm. And um, let me just give a brief description of, of those. Uh, we could go into a lot of detail of it, but we'll, we'll talk about the moral law first. Um, because that's most pertinent to our discussion. Um, it's not just the Ten Commandments. That that would be a classic example of the transcultural and transgenerational authority and applicability of the moral law of the Old Testament would be, for example, the Ten Commandments, because on close examination, all ten of the commandments, ten commandments, are repeated in the New Testament, sometimes several times. Mm -hmm. So we we see that the ten commandments, as a re reflection of part of the moral law, is still binding for the Christian, mm -hmm. um, and it's especially binding on us. And um, in fact, even it tells us in Scripture that the moral law is going to be the standard by which we're all judged at the end of the world, Revelation twenty two fourteen. So that's pretty significant. Uh, we need to know that. Uh, the moral law is inclusive. Um, both the Old and New Testament alike teach us plainly that, it's, that the moral law is to be obeyed inwardly as well as outwardly. Um, but if something is against God's moral law, it won't do to say that, well, 
uh, the person was sincere, motives are right. Uh, I've heard this, Laura, if I can get an example. Mm -hmm. um, some folks say that it's okay to practice EVPs if the motive is okay. Mm -hmm. They're given, you see what I'm saying is that some people mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. um, so-and-so is just doing this because they're being disrespectful or just doing it out of, out of fun, going into a um, cemetery and, and just being disrespectful of the spirits, as they say. Mm -hmm. But they would say that would be wrong, but attempting to contact the dead with clean motives is okay. Mm -hmm. The answer to that is no. Um, this is an instance where motive makes no difference. Mm -hmm. Um, because some actions are intrinsically abominable, and I cho chose that word specifically because that's the word that's used in Deuteronomy 18, yeah. is that necromancy is, um, is because the basic, the basic, uh, or the foundation for the moral law in the Old Testament is God's character, and God's character is unchanging, is immutable. And as, as, as New Testament says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. And so his character, his unchanging character, um, is reflected in the moral law. What was, and you alluded to this before, that what was repugnant and, uh, and abominable, abominable to him in the Old Testament is going is going to be the same now and forever. Mm -hmm. And attempting to speak to the dead is is one of those things as we come to Deuteronomy 18 after we finish this. But just a, a quick survey of the different kinds of laws is that the moral law in the Old Testament, which is really clear, sometimes it takes some discernment, but the context, uh, Laura, in the Old Testament usually makes it very clear whether the law is a moral law, a civil law, or a ceremonial law. Mm -hmm. uh, the civil law has something to do with the, the specific penalties and, and guidelines that were given to ancient Israel as a political body, as a nation. Um, and those things were... Um, th those things were not to be carried over because there's no equivalent of a New Testament Israel. Um, the civil, once again, the, the civil law things that uh, you know we can, that were considered um, capital crimes in the Old Testament. Well, their sins now, for example, people were put to death. Um, for a bunch of sins that could have been put to death in the Old Testament. We don't do that in the New Testament because we don't live in a theocracy mm -hmm. and we, we don't seek to. And I, I disagree um, gently with my brothers and sisters who are theonomists who want to basically reinstate the civil law um, in America. That's there, you know, we should try to see the Lordship of Christ. It's one thing to extend the Lordship of Christ over politics and in the morality that 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 uh, is um, that all law is built on. But it's another thing to try to take some of the specific things that were meant just for Israel uh, and and how they live their life. Um, in the Old Testament. So you got the civil law mm -hmm. in, um, in which there was a significant change in administration when the new covenant came mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're no longer uh, a, a theocracy. It's a worldwide body of Christ. And then you have the third kind of law and that is the ceremonial law. Mm -hmm. And we think of, um, for example, the day of Christ, you had two, um, two goats. Um, one of them was to lay the hands on. It was to be scapegoat. And the other one was to be sacrificed. And um, 
and then every day, of course, there was uh, sa the sacrifice for the high priest because of his sins and then for the sins of the people. But when Jesus came, um, he fulfilled this, and he fulfilled all of the Old Testament. And if I could, um, in this context, well, let me just stop there for a second. Mm -hmm. And um, again, there's so much that could be said, but that's where the sacrificial system was not so, this, the um, ceremonial law wasn't so much abolished as it was fulfilled mm -hmm. in Jesus. Yeah. Because he is the once for all sacrifice for all sin. Amen. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So any, any comment there before I move on? No, please, please continue. Okay. Um, and in this context, I, I think it's important that I read from, uh, if I may, from, from Matthew chapter 5, mm -hmm. because this is Jesus's comment on how we should interpret and imply, apply, excuse me, the, um, the Old Testament law today. Mm -hmm. And so everybody, please listen to this because this clarifies it a lot. In Matthew 5, starting in chapter 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, Okay, that's, that means not until he comes back again. Mm -hmm. um, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the, uh, the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And just a, to a real quick comment here, the law or the Torah refers to the first five books of the Old Testament while the prophets include the rest of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and when Jesus says to fulfill them, Jesus fulfills all of the Old Testament in that it all points to him, not only in its specific predictions of a Messiah, but also in its sacrificial system, which look forward to his great sacrifice of himself in the many events in which in the history of Israel which foreshadowed his life as God's true son in the law and in the wisdom literature he set forth a behavior pattern that his life exemplified. Jesus' gospel of the kingdom does not replace the Old Testament but rather fulfills it as Jesus' life and ministry coupled with his interpretation complete. Uh, and clarify God's intent and meaning, uh, meaning of the entire Old Testament. And then uh, one last comment about until heaven and earth pass away. Mm -hmm. Jesus confirms the full authority of the Old Testament as Scripture for all time, 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 16, even down to the smallest components of the written text. The iota is the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet or the yod of the Hebrew alphabet. And the dot likely refers to a tiny stroke or a part of a letter used to differentiate between Hebrew letters. And then pass away from the law means that the Old Testament remains an authoritative compendium of divine teaching or testimony and teaching within which some elements such as sacrifices and other ceremonial laws mm -hmm predicted or foreshadowed events that will be accomplished in Jesus' ministry and so are not, not now models for Christian behavior. And then the phrase, until all is accomplished, points to Jesus' fulfillment of specific Old Testament hopes, partly through his earthly life, his death, his resurrection, and then more fully after uh, his second coming. Mm -hmm. um, so... There you have a text that could not be clearer um, that Jesus didn't come to abolish any of either the ceremonial, civil, or moral law. Um, his his uh, debates with the Pharisees was was not to abolish it, but to clarify the interpretation and application of it. That's, that's the issue. People are saying that mm -hmm. Jesus threw out 
he threw out, you know, the ceremonial, the civil, and the moral law. He abolished all that because he fulfilled it. And that's the simplistic interpretation of Jesus' teaching because right here he's, he explicitly says, Laura, mm -hmm. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. Yep. And then he goes on further to say, you know, that not even an iota will pass away until I come back again, the second coming. So the point being is that in the interim between the first and second coming, he's, he's st stating that in some way, and I underline that in some way, all of the Old Testament is still applicable mm -hmm. to today, but none more so than the moral law because it's, it's most clearly recognizable mm -hmm. as far as is um, how we apply it to the evil and the error that's in our um, society and our culture today, and it's most specifically applicable to this issue of EVPs and, and angels that we're going to talk about uh, next time. Yeah, and you, you did mention um, to Timothy 3.16. Could I just read that? Please. Uh, at, this, at this point, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, you asked me to remind you of that verse. Yeah, yeah. How do you think that uh, plays into this, Laura? Well, yeah, you know, sometimes I, I would, myself, talking about the three different types of, of, of law in the Old Testament, sometimes I would think, for example, things that don't seem so relevant to us, like the um, dietary laws, um, and I would think, well, you know, there is something to be said about, okay, now we are allowed to eat certain foods, but there is something to be said about um, not consuming a lot of um, sea fish, for example, the prawns and that type of fish, because, they, they, you know, apparently they're scavengers and they do consume a lot of toxins and that kind of thing. So although in the New Testament, every animal is now clean to eat, I could see why, yeah, that, that could still be uh, useful for for teaching, <laughs> useful to know. Um, <laughs> That's pretty so practical. Yeah, I was just reading about yeah. how, to, how to, I was just reading a few mm. days ago how tilapia, um, and no wonder it's so much cheaper than uh, salmon <laughs> because they apparently are bottom feeders and there's, at least uh, in North Carolina, there's a lot of talk about how not to eat tilapia. It's uh, just not very good. But in addition to that, all of the laws, including very specific um, laws like di dietary laws and uh, so forth, they're, they're reflections of life in a theocracy, in a community um, that is bound together in a u unique way um, that it was done in the Old Testament. And one example would be it, um, of applying a, a rule that seems kind of irrelevant today would be um, in the Old Testament it says, if you have a balcony, you must build a parapet around it. And that just means a balcony, mm -hmm. uh, I mean uh, a railing rather. If you have a balcony, put a railing around it. Well, what's because lots of times they would go up to the roof and socialize or nap or whatever. So, what's the application for today of that? Well, okay, not too many people go up to the roofs today to socialize, mm -hmm. but but the principle would be behind it is that God so values human life that he would give specific instructions about protecting people from unnecessary harm. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could say, well, putting a um, fence around a, um, a fence around a, a, um, a swimming pool would be an example of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all applicable um, in different ways. So, hang on a second. I was on my phone. Yeah. Okay. 
Absolutely. So I, I so I got a little distracted there for a second, but um, you can't. There's there's so much to 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 um, you know, pe people to bring up all kinds of different things like um, don't put different kinds of threads together and that sort of thing. And we don't do that today, so why should we listen to? But again, we realize that if you understand, number one, that Israel was a theocracy, a one-time theocracy, and they had specific laws, that, and, and it's, it's so crucial, Laura, to understand this distinction between the civil, the ceremonial, and the moral law. And there's overlap because, you know, to obey all of these laws, you know, it was a moral obligation. But still, nevertheless, we can rightly, um, and theologians have for, for millennia, have made this classic distinction between these three different laws. And when we come to Deuteronomy 18, um, the context is so clear that it is God's transgenerational, that means for all time, and transcultural, that means for all cultures, authority uh, that Deuteronomy 18 is, that is part of God's uh, uh, abiding moral law for the New Testament. It's it's, um, it's so clear that the burden of proof it would be on those who would say that it's not binding today. There mm -hmm. would have to be a clear injunction in the New Testament mm -hmm. saying that it's now okay to speak to demons. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that's not going to happen because elsewhere we're told not to, like in 1 Corinthians 11 mm -hmm. um, and so forth. But I'll, I just read, I'll just read Deuteronomy yes. 18, Mark, at this point. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, th these things are um, said to be an abomination. So, Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. There shall not be fun found amongst you anyone that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or that uses divination or an observer of the times, an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before, before thee. And I've said a few times before, you know, that phrase, consulter with familiar spirits, um, familiar spirits doesn't mean, you know, a, a nice, charming, friendly, familiar spirit who, who you're familiar with. <laughs> um, or even one of your, you know, family members. It does actually mean in the Hebrew, demon. Yes. Um, and often when we see in the Bible comments also about not um, contacting the dead, um, and there's different, you know, obviously translations of the Bible, but what it actually means is do not attempt to contact the dead. So it's not as if God is even saying in, in these statements it's possible to contact the dead. No, he's not. He's actually saying don't attempt to contact the dead because in actual fact, you will be deceived and you will end up with a demon. That's um, a great point because I've heard very otherwise um, solid Christians say, well, if God forbid, for, forbid us from attempting to communicate uh, communicate with dead and that must imply that um that they were able to be communicated with mm -hmm. and that simply doesn't follow that's a non sequitur i'm gl so glad you said that he he was saying you know don't communicate dead it's, it's don't attempt to communicate with mm -hmm. the dead. Mm -hmm. The implication being is you're going to be talking to someone else and it's not going to be the dead Yep, and, and similarly, like, you know, in the New Testament, when there was the storm and Jesus was walking in the water and the disciples were frightened at first and, and they said, oh, you know, wow, is that his ghost? You know, and, and, and Jesus, he said, do not be afraid, it is I. Um, 
but he mm. didn't then stop and say, by the way, guys, I need to give you a teaching on that whole notion of ghosts because obviously they were still going by folklore and all that. Just because they were his disciples didn't mean they knew everything or they had a grasp of all teaching yet. But in the middle of a storm, Jesus walking in the water, it wasn't a time and place for him to say, let's sit down and have a, a, a discussion here about the whole realm of ghosts and so on. Um, right. that, that would probably be something he would discuss with them later, I imagine, once they, they got out of that <laughs> situation. Exactly, exactly. That's a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've written on that particular text extensively because, again, many um, well-versed theologians um, within the church pastors have said that that one chapter, like Mark 6 or parallel text, um, convince them that Jesus must have believed in ghosts. And it just saddens me because mm. really, if you proper, it was called exegesis, which just means taking out of the text what is there, what's clearly there, using proper hermeneutical techniques or interpretive techniques, as opposed to isogesis, which is improper. That's reading into the text your prior um understanding of what the text should mean or what you want it to mean. Mm -hmm. So if you really look at that text clearly, you'll see that it, it actually has a commentary on it. Uh, the last verse, I think it's verse 51 in that pericope or that, the, that little section, it says that um, even after even after having seen Jesus feed the 4,000 and the 5,000, their hearts were still hardened. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the concluding comment to their comments about Jesus being a ghost. So the point being is that Mark, the writer of that gospel, is implying that everything that they said about Jesus was an expression of both fear um, and lack of faith mm -hmm. and hardness of heart. And we know that until Pentecost, they were stumbling over their words. They were, as you said, like even the, the Pharisees, the teachers, so many of them were caught up in the folklore, uh, which included spiritism, spirits, ghosts, and all that sort of thing. That was rampant. Mm -hmm. And... At that time, they were afraid for their lives. Mm -hmm. And it's not silence to say that Jesus didn't correct them. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't record it. Mm -hmm. But it's probably more likely that he, um, you know, when somebody is, is in fear of their life, that's not just the be best time to give somebody a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned there, you know, the church and, and how some Christians... Um, feel that they can explain um, explain things but yeah uh, you know it's it reminds me of you had said to me recently as well about Francis Schaeffer um, yeah. and he has felt the need to confront evil and, and error and, and uh. he feels that you know today's church especially has opted out of that and opted out of confronting it and, and actually um, what 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 happens is that uh, actually it allows an accommodation of that evil because as you just said there, our silence is is consent. Um, and you yeah. you read his last uh, book, the Great Evangelical Disaster, and he speaks of that in there that that you know many churches and pastors and leaders sadly are fall prey to the spirit of the age. They're they're not applying the lordship of Christ over the full spectrum of life and thought. Um, mm. But mm. as you have said, absolute truth does demand loving confrontation or we end up accommodating it. Um, silence is consent. And that, that is really sad because then, you know, the people people do often listen to what, what their pastors and leaders say. And if this whole subject is just ignored, then boy, oh boy. Gosh, I tell you, I think you've hit the nail on the head because I, 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 as I thought about, remember we ended last time where I asked this plaintive rhetorical question, why? Mm. Why, with it being so clear, are Christians still 
uh, disobeying Deuteronomy 18. Mm-hmm. And so our discussing of the different kinds of law, I think, is part of it. Part of it is um, leadership in the church being unreflective of what's happening in society, not being aware of um, the world spirit and how the demonic world spirit is manifesting itself. And then out of fear of rocking the boat Mm -hmm. or whatever, we just have had a sad history. Uh, And you mentioned Schaefer here. Um, I just love his, his, the way he, he uh, approaches it. And I've, I've got a few things here, if I may, is that just, you pretty much said it all, but truth demands confrontation. It must be loving confrontation, but there must be confrontation nonetheless. Um, sadly, and I'm quoting from Schaefer's book, uh, The Evangelical Disaster, and he'll explain in a second what this disaster is. Mm-hmm. Sadly, we must say that this has seldom happened, that is, confrontation regarding both evil practice, which EVP is, is, is evil practice, as well as um, unorthodox beliefs. Um, sadly, we must say that this is, has seldom happened in the church. Most of the evangelical has not been active in the battle, or listen to this, mm-hmm. Laura, mm-hmm. or even been able to see that we are in a battle. Yeah, yeah. And and when it comes to the issues of the day, the evangelical world most often has said nothing or worse, has said nothing different from what the world would say. So here is a great evangelical disaster. Mm -hmm. The failure of the evangelical world to stand for truth as truth. There's only one word for this, namely, accommodation. Mm -hmm. The evangelical church accommodated to the world spirit of the age. They have accommodated on scripture and its authority, but then also he speaks, and this is what we're touching on, more pertinent to our discussion, is they're in an accommodation on issues with no clear stand being taken and... You know, I have thought of it, and what brought me into this whole thing in 2008 is that I realized, Laura, this, that, um, let me back up for a second. In in Scotland um, and in America, how many sermons do you think Bible-believing Christians or pastors have preached in the last year on the dangers of the paranormal? Well, Mark, I've been a Christian now over 20 years and I've been to many sermons, many, many churches, I've visited many and honestly, uh, very, very few and I I don't think I'm exaggerating if I say I think it's only been at meetings where the pastor actually asked me along to speak at. Yeah. And that's really quite frightening. It really is. It's frightening and deeply sad because we are... Go ahead. Even when when pastors um, and leaders have asked me along to speak, um, often when I'm speaking and sharing from the the front, I've noticed the absolute, you know, shock and horror on on their faces and and often in the whole of the congregation too. But in the beginning when I first began to share, this used to really surprise me because I thought... My goodness, don't these guys know this stuff? They're Christians. Uh, and especially the leaders, but it, but it is as if, no, there's just this kind of a, I don't know, blindness in the majority of the church about these things. Um, and you know what you were talking about as well? I think a lot of it is to do with how the Bible is not taken so literally now. A lot of preachers are now saying, oh, these, some of it's just metaphorical or symbolic and so on. And, uh, you know, anyway, we're more intellectual these days and what is truth anyway? And there's that whole area of truth is now yeah. seen as to be more relative. Therefore, that um, notion really d- does attack the infallibility of Scripture um, right. as well. And, and we know that whole truth is relative truth is absolute debate is a, a, an ongoing debate but people like um, 
Lee Strobel, for example, he wrote an excellent book where top scholars have debunked that whole truth is relative debate and they have actually shown truth is absolute. Actually, it is. Therefore, um, when the Bible says it is true and when Jesus says he is the truth, that is truth. Therefore, you can trust scripture. You can trust um, that the laws are still, the moral laws are still relevant today um, and for this discussion regarding ghosts and angels and so on. Right, yeah, John seventeen seventeen. Um, it doesn't just say that the John seventeen seventeen. It doesn't just say that the Bible has truth in it. It says the Bible is the Word of God is true, aletheia. And the, the primary Greek definition of aletheia means that it corresponds to reality. And that's what I uh, Schaefer has said over and over again. We believe in what um, it kind of sounds like stuttering, but true truth, mm -hmm. not relativi relativistic truth, which varies from one person to the next, mm -hmm. but truth that is objective, and it's true whether you or I believe it or not. It's like two plus two equals to four. It is true whether I want it to be true or not, and the criterion for what many people, it, might, it may be conscious or unconscious, the criterion many people use for determining whether or not a belief or practice is true is if they like it or not. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's a wretched, terrible, shallow um, way to go about making decisions as to the criterion for truth because it leaves a, a void for our children. And our culture has slid in the last 80 years – Western culture, whether on the continent or in the U.S., in the last 80 years or so, there has been a horrible decline. And I would put, and I say this with tears, mm -hmm. Laura, because I am an ordained minister going back to 1984 in a specific denomination. I have a love for pastors. Mm -hmm. But the primary, if you were to ask me what the primary reason for, for the decline in both Europe and in the United States, there's various causes. But the main one is the lack of Christian leadership. And by leader, Christian leadership, I mean not only pastors, but also seminaries and, um, and publications, books and so forth, in which there has been very little attempt encourage courageous attempt to be valiant for truth and to understand uh, the spirit of the age as it's presenting itself in our generation. We seem to be like a generation behind and catching up. Mm -hmm. And I can, when I think of, you know, there has to be problems because there's, there's tons of issues, right? Mm -hmm. But Laura, when it comes down to it, I can't, you know, short of just flat out Satanism, I can't think of a more dangerous or quicker way for a person to to come in direct contact with a demonic mm -hmm. and by engaging in EVPs or just by simply trying to communicate with the dead. Mm -hmm. And that's that is, I think, our passionate uh, cry out mm -hmm. of love um, for the people who are listening is mm -hmm. that they, whether it's whatever reason they're doing it, is that the bottom line is that because of being, of not applying the Lordship of Christ to the entirety of their belief and practice, but by attempting to speak to the dead, you are speaking with demons. And you're, you cannot speak with demons without there being very significant lasting results, you will get burned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying this should be way high on the priority list of evangelicals. And there's no excuse in my mind is for why pastors should not be applying this in teaching from the pulpit mm -hmm. and not just, you know, reserving it perhaps for a Wednesday Bible study or something like that. Mm -hmm. It needs to come from the pulpit so that our folks can be equipped mm -hmm. to understand that there's a difference between supernatural evil and the supernatural that comes from God. 
but many people don't understand that. They'll see the sensational activity, but as you and I both know that everything that glitters is not gold in the paranormal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, this is real watershed um, that faces evangelicalism today. And it's, I say this love with, with tears is that we, we have to draw a line and say, you know, if, if you can affirm all day long that you believe in the inerrancy and authority of Scripture, but if you're not if you're not obeying the Bible, then you're denying and practice the authority of Scripture. Of mm -hmm. course, none of us are perfect, and we have to repent mm -hmm. and ask God for forgiveness every day. But if since the the main issue is EVPs, mm -hmm. if I, I will just say this clearly is with all the love and tenderness in my heart, Laura, is that there is no excuse and there should be an outcry of why are Christians of all people on the one hand posting all kinds of things about the Lordship of Christ on Facebook uh -huh. and then turning around on the weekend and going on investigations and engaging in communication with the dead um, via EP EVPs. Well, it's like, as you say, uh, you know, I guess, and it is human nature, and, and Mark and I are not for one second insinuating that we are perfect and that we don't sin. We're not at all. But, you know, human nature can be, uh, if people can get away with something or, or, you know, they'll do something because they want to or because they like it. Uh, but instead, we all should be, um, not just regarding EVPs, but, but, but regarding all aspects of our lives. We all should be yes. submitting to the authority of God and the Bible and what he says about a certain thing rather than because uh, we like it or because we want to. Um, we just have two minutes left. and Next time we'll get into some um, more nitty-gritty details that we haven't ever shared before. Um, Mark and I on this topic will go into much more the, of, of real life examples of people who have communicated with so called ghosts and angels, including people who, who are born again Christians. Um, so it will be a bit darker than we've normally uh, looked at, but we do feel it is necessary to go there um, uh, and to discuss these things in a bit more depth. Um, and yeah, I do hope that, you know, the church will teaching these things not just at halloween but all through the year and of course yes. some don't even mention it at halloween anyway uh, and we don't want to dwell on these things but you know we do want to warn folks and prevention is better than cure so mark we, we just have one minute left and um, could you please um tell folks that the title of your book where they can get it and pray for the audience please Ah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, Mark Hunneman, and my book is Seeing Goes Through God's Eyes, and you can get it through Amazon, and that would be the best way to, to get it. And so let, let's pray, shall we? Mm, yeah. Heavenly Father, um, I put myself at the, at the top of this list. I repent of the sometimes haughty way in which I slip into, it seems, standing in judgment of, of Scripture instead of sitting humbly under its judgments. And I pray, Lord, that yes, me too, Lord. For, for Laura and I and for our, our audience that, um, that we would come to Scripture with our minds um, humble and not made up, that we would come to your Word expecting to hear from hear from it not an echo of our own thoughts but to hear the thunderclap of 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 you your love your truth and lord please allow the word of god to confront us to disturb our security mm -hmm. to undermine our complacency and to overthrow our patterns of thought and yes. behavior that that are uh, displeasing to you. And so again, we pray that you would water the, the seeds that were sown. And since we talked about the Bible so much, thank you that in your kindness and love, you've given us true truth without which we will be lost in this world. Mm 
And we love you, Lord Jesus, and pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, listeners, so much for hanging with us. Um, we have had some difficulties with Skype. Sometimes there's been a pause happening in these broadcasts, so we do thank you, and we sincerely apologize for that. And, Mark, we shall speak to you again really soon for part five. Great. Thank you. Speak to you then. Bye-bye. The views expressed in this production may not necessarily be those of Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio. Zizek for your life with Eternal Radio. End Time Hour is broadcast only on Eternal Radio, along with a host of other unique and excellent programs. Now Eternal Radio is even easier to listen to. You can do this by simply visiting eternalradio.org.uk. That's eternalradio.org.uk and clicking on the Listen Now link. Alternatively, you can listen in on your phone by downloading the TuneIn app or Eternal Radio's very own dedicated apps for both Android and iPhone. It's also possible to tune in on a variety of other platforms, including Amazon's Fire TV. Also, if you have any questions for me or for other Eternal Radio hosts, please email us at onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk. That's onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk.